One of the things that has troubled me about the legacy of conservation is that it has this notion that sometimes excludes the beneficial aspects of humans participating in the landscape. So we get this, what people are calling fortress conservation, right? Let's keep the people out because people and nature are a bad mix. That, of course, manifested itself in, in removal of indigenous peoples to create parks. My own tribal homelands are now called the, the, the National Forest. Because there was this belief that, that people necessarily overexploit and damage landscapes, it completely overlooked the fact that, that human people, particularly based in indigenous science and worldview, can have a really beneficial aspect or beneficial influence on, on the land. For much of the history of, of Western-based conservation, social justice has simply not been an element of that thinking. The thinking is, you know, all about what can we take from the land. But the identity of people and the identity of land are so closely linked with one another that you can't have healthy human communities without healthy land, and that the inverse is true that the land needs people's agency, not only in terms of hands-on land care and stewardship, but the land needs people to love it. You know, we have to have that emotional and spiritual bond to, to land. So people need to be included for the longevity, the biodiversity of, of the land to thrive. Social justice is such an important and often missing element of conservation because there is so much privileging of who has access to the land. We call oftentimes conservation is around public land. There's so much gatekeeping about who can be on that land and what can you do on that land. I think about in, in elements of indigenous society, the ways in which our people have been prohibited from practicing ceremony on the land, because now it's public land. So we couldn't possibly have sacred or religious activities on public land. The, the, the social justice and cultural um, assault that that represents is, is tremendous. And so the gatekeeping around who has access not only access for so-called recreation, um, but for all of the facets of human relationship to place. We think about the multiple use doctrine, right? Well, what's the land for? Wood, a commodity, water, wildlife, and recreation. As if those are the only four ways that people interact with land. Um, what about berry picking? What about medicine gathering? What about ceremonies of gratitude and celebration? What about connection to your ancestors? What about rural livelihood? What about subsistence? What about the sacred exchange between people and land? We need a much bigger vision of conservation. As a plant ecologist, as a scientist, so much of my engagement with the conservation community is all about the materiality of the land, the resource, right? In indigenous ways of thinking, we don't call them natural resources, we call them our relatives, right? These are beings, these are people who are sharing their gifts with each other. And when somebody shares their gift with you, you know, your first response is gratitude, right? And that gratitude cements this relationship of love. And where in the conservation dogmas does love appear? I think it is the most important relationship that we have with land. And yet, much of our formulas around conservation doesn't include how to invite people to love the world more. And what does that love look like on, on, on the land? People say, what do I love too much to lose? And what will I do to protect it, to care for it, 
Eco-psychologists have been um, using these terms of species loneliness for human people to say that we are lonely for our more than human kin. This feeling of being alone at you know, the top of this fictional pyramid of human exceptionalism is lonely at the top, right? We suffer from our lack of connection, loving connection to, to the living world. But that love and loneliness go both ways. I believe deeply that the land is lonely for us, that the land loves us, and we need that conduit to love the land back. And out of that, anything is possible. Anything is possible. I have witnessed in response to breeding sweetgrass what I can only describe as longing, this almost desperate longing to love the land again and to be loved by the land again. So many offerings of stories. It awakens in them this kind of remembering. What would it be like to be held by the land? What would it be like if I could hold my head up high in front of my uh, bird and tree relatives and say, there goes somebody who we are glad is a citizen, an ecological citizen of this place. It's tied up with honor, with, 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 with wanting to be an honorable relationship with, with the living world. And I think we are in the time of what I like to call the great remembering. And that's what I'm feeling from people, is that they are remembering what it would be like to be held by the land. And they are longing for that. Thank you.